and lead our lives. Terrific. Okay, so this is Senate Health and Welfare. We are back on February 2nd. We're looking at two more bills. Uh, we're looking at S26, which is uh, a correction, a technical correction, an improvement to uh, help patient choices at end of life um, residency. And then we'll, then we'll move on from there. Me, me, me. my computer. I mean, it's it's first, we need to fix. <laughs> Did you fix it? I think so. I was okay. Muted until it wasn't. Okay. Could be dangerous. Technical corrections. So we have our ledge council here with us, who's drafted both of the bills we're looking at, S twenty six and S eighteen. Are you ready? Yes. So, Jen, introduce yourself for the record, yes. and then we'll go ahead with S26. And I understand uh, that you can give us a little background on the whole process for end of life choices. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, good morning, Jen Carby, Director and Chief Counsel, Office of Legislative Counsel. Um, and so, we are looking first at S26 an act relating to removing the residency requirement from Vermont's patient choice at end of life laws. And I thought what might be most useful is to, um, to maybe talk a little bit about what, what the existing process is, but also walk you through in statute what that looks like. And I could point out the two places in the statute that the bill would be uh, making changes in. So, up. Right. So this is uh, the existing statutory chapter. It's in Title 18, it's Chapter 113, and it's entitled Patient Choice at End of Life. And the basic idea behind this, people have given it various names over the years, death with dignity, physician-assisted suicide. We used patient choice at end of life, and I think um, the term I'm hearing frequently now is medical aid in dying. They're all describing the same thing, which is where a patient with a terminal condition uh, requests medication from a physician to hasten their own death, uh, medication to be self-administered. So I'm going to show you what this process looks like in our statutes. Um, and this committee, those who were on this committee last year uh, or last session, remember making some changes to the statute to allow uh, telemedicine and to eliminate a waiting period between the final oral request and um, the prescription. <clears throat> so the way Vermont statute is the way Vermont statute is written, it's kind of through the lens of the physician who's writing the prescription. So in 18 BSA section 5283, we have the requirements for prescription and documentation, and there's immunity that attaches. So the way it's written, a physician will not be subject to any civil or criminal liability or professional disciplinary action if the physician prescribes to a patient with a terminal condition medication to be self-administered for the purpose of hastening the patient's death and the physician affirms by documenting in the patient's medical record that all of these actions that we'll see occurred. So I'll pause there for a couple of definitions. Um, probably most important for people who are new to this area is terminal condition. And as used in this chapter, terminal condition is an incurable and irreversible disease, which would, within reasonable medical judgment, result in death within six months. So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about a terminal condition. And then physician, as used in here, is really just uh, MDs and doctors of osteopathy. So that's, who, that's the universe of who we're talking about who would be actually doing the prescribing. So the physician has to document that all of the following actions occurred. First, the patient made an oral request to the physician in the physician's physical presence or by telemedicine. That's the part I ended last year. If the physician determines that the use of telemedicine is clinically appropriate. So the patient makes an oral request to the physician for medication to be self-administered for the purpose of hastening the patient's death. So this is the first oral request. Then the next step is that not fewer than 15 days after the first oral request, the physician made a second oral request either to, to the physician, either in the physician's physical presence or by telemedicine. Again, if the physician determines that use, using telemedicine is clinically appropriate, 
for medication to be self-administered for purposes of hastening the patient's death. So first oral request followed at least 15 days later by a second request, oral request for the medication. At the time of the second oral request, the physician has to offer the patient an opportunity to rescind the request. So um, obviously the patient can rescind the request at any time without this specific opportunity, but there has to be at the time of the second oral request, the physician making that offer. Fourth step is that the patient must also have made a written request somewhere in this process uh, for medication to be self-administered for purposes of hastening the patient's death. And that written request must have been signed by the patient in the presence of two or more witnesses who were not interested persons. And those are people who are um, the, the physician, a relative of the patient, uh, somebody who would, be, would stand to inherit upon the patient's death, or someone, an owner, operator, or employee of a healthcare facility, nursing home, or residential care facility where the patient is receiving treatment or is a resident. So somebody who is not one of those and interested people, uh, two of those witnesses have to witness the patient signing the written request for this medication. And they have to sign and affirm that the patient appeared to understand the nature of the document and to be free from duress or undue influence at the time the request was signed. So we now have two oral requests followed by an opportunity to rescind the second oral request and a written request. The physician has to have determined that the patient was suffering a terminal condition based on the physician's review of the patient's relevant medical records and a physician's physical examination of the patient. It may end up being a different physician if this prescribing physician is seeing the patient by telemedicine. So the physician has to determine that the patient was suffering a terminal condition, was capable, was making an informed decision, had made a voluntary request for medication to hasten the patient's own death, and, and this is one of the things we're, we'd be changing in the bill, was a Vermont resident. So the bill would be taking out, striking through that requirement that the patient, that the physician determined that the patient was a Vermont resident, and also would amend the underlying definition of patient in this chapter to take out the requirement that that person be a Vermont resident. So it would just be a person who is 18 years of age or older and under the care of a physician, but would no longer require them to be a Vermont resident. So the physician has to have made those, those determinations about the patient. The physician must have informed the patient in person or by telemedicine, both verbally and in writing of certain information, the patient's medical diagnosis, the patient's prognosis, including acknowledging that the physician's prediction of the patient's life expectancy is an estimate based on the physician's best medical judgment and not a guarantee of the actual time remaining in the patient's life, and the patient could live longer than the time predicted. The range of treatment options appropriate for the patient and the patient's diagnosis. If the patient was not enrolled in hospice care, information on all feasible end-of-life services, including palliative care, comfort care, hospice care, and pain control. The range of possible results, including potential risks associated with taking the medication to be prescribed, and the probable result of taking the medication to be prescribed. So that is information that the physician is giving in person or by telemedicine, both verbally and in writing to the patient. The physician must document that the physician referred the patient to a second physician for medical confirmation of the diagnosis, prognosis, and determination that the patient was capable, acting voluntarily, and had made an informed decision. The physician must either have verified that the patient did not have impaired judgment or have referred the patient for an evaluation by a psychiatrist, psychologist, or clinical social worker licensed in Vermont for confirmation that the patient was capable and did not have impaired judgment. If applicable, the physician consulted with the patient's primary care physician with the patient's consent. So if the physician is not the patient's primary care physician. The physician informed the patient that the patient may rescind the request at any time and in any manner and as we noted above, offered the patient an opportunity to rescind after the patient's second oral request. 
The physician ensured that all of the required steps were carried out in accordance with the section and confirmed immediately prior to writing the prescription that the patient was making an informed decision. The physician wrote the prescription after the last to occur of the following events, the patient's written request for medication, the patient's second oral request, and the physician offering the patient an opportunity to rescind the request. And this is the piece last year where uh, the legislature removed the, there had been a 48 hour waiting period after the last to occur of those events. And they got rid of the 48 hour waiting period. So the prescription now can be written immediately following or any time following the last to occur of that written request, second oral request and opportunity to rescind. Then the physician either dispensed the medication directly, as long as the physician at the time they dispensed the medication was licensed to dispense medication in Vermont, had a current, current Drug Enforcement Administration DEA certificate and complied with any applicable administrative rules. So the physician either dispensed it themselves if they were authorized to do so, or with the patient's written consent, contacted a pharmacist and informed the pharmacist of the prescription <laughs> and delivered the written prescription personally or by mail or fax to the pharmacist who dispensed the medication to the patient, the physician, or an expressly identified agent of the patient. And then the physician must have recorded and filed the following information in the patient's medical record. The date, time, and wording of all oral requests of the patient for the medication, all written requests by the patient for the medication, the physician's diagnosis, prognosis, and basis for the determination that the patient was capable, acting voluntarily, and had made an informed decision. The second physician's diagnosis, prognosis, and verification that the patient was capable, acting voluntarily, and had made an informed decision. The physician's attestation that the patient was enrolled in hospice care at the time they made the oral and written request for medication or that the physician informed the patient of all feasible end of life services. The physician's verification that the patient either did not have impaired judgment or that the physician referred the patient for an evaluation and the person who conducted that evaluation determined the patient did not have impaired judgment. The report of the outcome and determinations made during any evaluation that the patient may have received the date, time, and wording of the physician's offer to the patient to rescind the request at the time of the patient's second oral request, and a note by the physician indicating that all of the requirements under this full section we've been going through were satisfied and describing all of the steps taken to carry out the request, including a notation medication prescribed. And then after writing the prescription, the physician must have promptly filed a report with the health department documenting completion of all of the requirements under this section. And then it specifies that this section shall not be construed to limit civil or criminal liability for gross negligence, recklessness, or intentional misconduct. And there are some other provisions uh, in the existing act, but that's really the, the main process. And so the things for you to know, then I wanted you to have context for looking at this bill, but the things to know about what this bill does, because everything we just looked at is already existing law, we would be looking at changing the definition here of patient for purposes of this chapter to remove the requirement that the patient be a resident of Vermont. And then down in the list of determinations that the physician must have made, eliminating the determination that the patient was a Vermont resident since that would not be required. It's a short bill. It is a short bill. So questions for Jen on the bill? Yes. So it essentially, it, it removes residency requirement for utilizing the program or the system that Jen has just described. And it took us a long time to put the whole thing together in the first place. <clears throat> Go ahead. So is it maybe appropriate at this point to talk about uh, who would be invited in to testify? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah, so we will get folks in to testify. <clears throat> We're not going to put this up on the agenda uh, for a couple of weeks at least, but um, yeah, it would be good. I, I think if you have a suggestion, then you know, give it to Alex, and then when we go through the agenda, we'll we'll put it in. I've already I've written down 
one expert in the state on this. But if you have someone you'd like to have in to testify, that'd be awesome. But you know, I, I'm pretty new at this, so I really yeah. don't know subject matter experts. But but topic wise, um, yeah. uh, precedent for uh, writing law to affect uh, non residents. Okay. Would be I just can't you know that's the part I have to get my head around. Uh, if I'm not objecting to the intent of the original bill, etc. I'm just more interested in mm -hmm. precedent. Okay, we got that. We can do that. In that vein, um, what is, and pardon my ignorance, but what's the relationship between end of life care and insurance? And this will that play a role in out of state or non resident folks receiving care? Does that make sense? It does. I think you you know you may want to hear from, or we could certainly get information from the insurers about what is currently covered. We can only affect um, what insurance in Vermont would cover. So it would be if, if there was a patient from out of Vermont using um, Vermont's process, then that would be dependent on what kind of coverage they had. It would not be within our control. And, and there could be some selection for people who can afford to have this type of care without insurance. So, I mean, yeah. there may be coverage for seeing, you know, depending on the network yeah. um, that, that the provider is in and what the coverage is that the <coughs> patient has, excuse me, from out of state, there may be coverage for medical appointments, but not necessarily for the prescription medication itself. Um, I think that would be very situation dependent, but there may be folks who know, and I don't know, um, we'll find out. Some of the advocates may, may have a better sense of it. Yes, ma'am. Actually, I'd like to take uh, uh, Senator Gulick's uh, thought to a different, slightly different level. That's, I think, the perspective was medical insurance. I'd be interested in the impact on life insurance because, you know, would this be considered for an out of state or uh, essentially assisted suicide, which nullifies their policies? That's, a, I think, that would be. A, a relevant question. It, and I, I would say that a lot of these questions are not within your control. Um, so because we can only regulate um, coverage that is being offered in this state, there is language in the existing statute that says a person and their beneficiary shall not be denied benefits under a life insurance policy as defined in our statutes for actions taken in accordance with this chapter, but that may not be enforceable Right. Correct. At least we need to understand that uh, you know, the impact on a, on a non resident. So and so it does it does raise the question as to uh, how much information a professional a physician in this state is required to share with someone from out of state, if any. So so we'll have to have Dr. Barnard it maybe to. Um, talk with us about that. I mean, there does raise the question, but the physician is protected uh, from, uh, from professional misconduct charges or issues by following the law. Right. And so if there's no residency requirement. Right. I mean, for the most part, for, uh, for our, our, uh, health insurance and other laws, we're not specific about whether the patient must be a Vermont resident or not. The issue right. of whether the treatment is covered is really between them and their insurer to determine before, before or after they seek the care. Um, so the difference here is that we currently have a residency requirement that would be being removed. Um, but I think the yeah. cross border and issues are the same yeah. as, as in other areas of healthcare. It would be good to have some examples of other areas that yes, Senator Reeves was asking about other areas where residency is non-existent or existent. Yeah, that. But the, I, it's a sensitive nature of this issue that draws attention to the questions that you know produces the questions that we're asking. Right. Did you want me to put the language up? I realized I took you through the sure may as well. Let's go through it once and then we'll move on to the next bill. So, 
Nothing confidential in my toolbars or bookmarks. All right. All right, so this is S26. The chair is the sponsor. Um, and as we've discussed, it would eliminate the bill, would eliminate the requirement that a patient who is terminally ill must be a Vermont resident in order to be prescribed medication in accordance with Vermont's patient choice at end of life laws. And the bill has two substantive sections. The first would be amending the definition section in this chapter on patient choice at end of life to remove the residency requirement. And the second section, as we discussed, would take out of the list of what the physician must affirm occurred and document occurred uh, in order to receive immunity, physician's determination that the patient was a Vermont resident. Take effect on passage. That was short. <laughs> Okay, so that's the that's that bill. Um, questions, or if you have questions you'd like answered through uh, testimony, just let me know and let Alex know if you have someone you think should be testifying. And remember, I think you know what what's going to happen. What happens with this issue every time is that there are uh, organizations and represent advocates who are categorically against having uh, the end of life choices for patients. So we're gonna hear from them. But the issue here is residency. We already have underlying statute. We're not gonna go back uh, there again. We've been through it. Um, so it's really about this residency issue and the questions you're asking are things that we'd probably wanna to get to. Okay. That's good, thank you. Sure. So we're now we're going to move on to uh, another bill. And I just want to say uh, the, the bill that we have on cosmetics and the bill that we have on tobacco products, the S18 that we'll be looking at next with Jen, these are bills that I have I introduced uh, at least the cosmetics bill in another iteration, uh, as well as tobacco in another iteration before the pandemic. And then we did take some testimony and passed at least one of them during the pan end of the pandemic process. So now I'm hopeful that we can get to some closure on these issues and, and act on these bills soon. <laughs> we'll see. It's like poor Senator Hardy and I are seeing things. <laughs> I know, it's all day job in the day. <laughs> yes. Yes. Good. Okay, so let's let's go through S18, Jen. Hey. Um, is there any uh, background? I think one thing I want to say about this bill is in the previous iteration of the bill, there was what's known as purchase, use, and possession. Uh, that section has come out and is now resides in economic development, commerce and economic development. That's their um, jurisdiction. So this deals really with um, public health issues, this bill. And the travels for this bill will be different. It will probably will end up going to finance for a little bit as well as I think cosmetics might end up with you, but we'll, we'll find out. All right, so I'm going to put this bill up. So now you should be seeing S18. This is an act relating to banning flavored tobacco products and e-liquids. Um, and it was introduced by several members of this committee and others. Um, so it starts out with a number of findings. Do you just want me to walk through? Sure. The findings? Okay. Yeah, a little bit. Um, so it, it goes through findings that, that these are things that the General Assembly finds. Um, tobacco use is costly, and it talks about amounts spent. Um, some of these, a number of these numbers may be a bit outdated, particularly as we get further in, because there has been no new uh, report on the Vermont Youth Risk Behavior Survey since 2019. So a lot of that. And we're hoping that's going to come out soon. I'm trying to keep an eye on when it comes out. I know. I just looked again today. Just yeah, it's not there yet, right? Uh, no, we're still. It's the 2021 
report we're waiting on. And I and I just I do know this is a side comment that the use of uh, youth use of tobacco and baking products, particularly flavored, has gone up significantly during the pandemic. I think significantly. That's gone up. Yeah. Not uh, all right. So Vermont spends $348 million annually to treat tobacco cost illnesses, including 87.2 million each year in Medicaid expenses. This is a, translates to a tax burden each year of $759 per Vermont household with productivity losses <laughs> adding an additional $232.8 million. Uh, youth tobacco use is growing due to e-cigarettes. 7% of Vermont high school students smoke, at least based on that data from the last Vermont Youth Risk Behavior Survey. But if e-cigarette use is included, 28% of Vermont youths use some form of tobacco product. More than one in four Vermont high school students now uses e-cigarettes and use more than doubled among this age group from 12% to 26% between the years 2017 and 2019. More students report frequent use of e-cigarettes, which indicates possible nicotine addiction, according to that most recent Vermont Youth Risk Behavior Survey that we have for 2019. 31% of Vermont high school e-cigarette users use e-cigarettes daily, the 31% up from 15% in 2017. Flavored products are fueling the epidemic, 97% of youth e-cigarette users nationally reported in 2019 that they had used a flavored tobacco product in the, in the last month, and 70% cited flavors as the reason for their use. E-cigarette and e-liquid manufacturers have marketed their products in youth-friendly flavors such as gummy bear, birthday cake, candy cane menthol, and bubble gum. Mint and menthol flavored e-cigarettes are increasing in popularity among youths. Over the past few years, mint and menthol went from being among the least popular to being some of the most popular e-cigarette flavors among high school students. And evidence indicates that if any e-cigarette flavors remain on the market, youths will shift from one flavor to another. For example, after Juul restricted the availability of fruit, candy, and other e-cigarette flavors in retail stores in November 2018, Use of mint and menthol e-cigarettes by high school users increased from 42.3% in 2017 to 63.9% using mint and menthol e-cigarettes in 2019. It is essential that menthol cigarettes are included in a ban on flavored tobacco products, flavored e-liquids, and flavored e-cigarettes to present, prevent youth who become addicted to nicotine from vaping from transitioning to traditional cigarettes. Menthol creates a cooling and numbing effect that reduces the harshness of cigarette smoke and suppresses the cough reflex. Those effects make menthol cigarettes more appealing to young, inexperienced smokers, and research shows that menthol cigarettes are more likely to addict youth. Youth smokers are the age group most likely to use menthol cigarettes, but are also likely to quit if menthol cigarettes are no longer available. 54% of youths 12 to 17 years of age nationwide who smoke use menthol cigarettes. Nearly 65% of young menthol smokers say they would quit smoking if menthol cigarettes were banned. Eliminating the sale of menthol tobacco products promotes health equity. Menthol cigarette use is more prevalent among persons of color who smoke than among white persons who smoke and is more common among lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender smokers than among heterosexual smokers. 85% of African-American adult smokers use menthol cigarettes, and of Black youths 12 to 17 years of age who smoke, seven out of 10 use menthol cigarettes. Tobacco industry documents show a concerted effort to target African-Americans <clears throat> through specific advertising efforts. And finally, for the findings, uh, and this one is fairly new, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration agrees that menthol cigarettes harm the public health. In 2013, the FDA published a report concluding that removal of menthol cigarettes from the market would improve public health. And in May of 2022, the FDA published a proposed rule establishing a tobacco product standard that would prohibit menthol as a characterizing flavor in cigarettes. But that rule has not been finalized, 
and it is unclear when a final rule will be published or take effect. Check again as early as recently as this morning, and still no, still more, not no more information. I keep hoping. That's all right. That's um, all right. So um, section two of the bills where we get into the statutes. This would be start with amending definitions in the tobacco products chapter. Can we just hold there yeah. on the on the findings? You know, or the findings don't go into statute, but they are explanatory of what is what the importance of the bill and. So because the results of the latest youth risk behavior survey haven't come out, we don't have the data as, you know, as we go through the session, we'll hopefully see that, that, that report, but there are also others will have come in to testify, we'll have some updates on some of this. Yeah, the health department may have, I know they've been quite busy in the last three years, um, but they may have some of this data, even if they're not ready. Even to, if it's not in the final report. Yeah, but yeah. report. I don't, I don't know, but we can certainly ask them. Okay, so section two, definitions in the tobacco products chapter. The first would make some modifications to the definition of tobacco products, um, <laughs> partly to kind of separate it from this catch-all provision that refers to the tobacco products tax in Title 32 because it gets sort of circular and confusing. So we're trying to put the language, the same language in both places. Um, so tobacco products under existing law means cigarettes, little cigars, roll your own tobacco, snuff cigars, new smokeless tobacco, and then we'd be replacing the other tobacco products as defined in the tax statutes and instead using the actual language and any other product manufactured from, derived from, or containing tobacco that is intended for human consumption by smoking, by chewing, or in any other manner. So that's tobacco for the changes to tobacco products. Tobacco substitute, um, this is in some cases clarifying, in some cases it expanding the definition of um, tobacco substitute, which is really the term that we have used in statute for a number of years to um, to, to describe e-cigarettes or vapes or however you want to, whatever term you want to use. So a tobacco substitute means any product, including an electronic cigarette or other electronic or battery powered device or any component part or accessory thereof, that contains or is designed to deliver nicotine or other substances into the body through the inhalation or other absorption of aerosol, vapor, or other emission, and that has not been approved by the US FDA for tobacco cessation or other medical purposes. And this is existing language, but product that has been approved by the FDA for tobacco cessation or other medical purposes <clears throat> is not a tobacco substitute. So it's outside of uh, the scope of this check. And then we have a new definition of e-liquid, which is the solution, substance, or other material used in or with a tobacco substitute that is heated or otherwise acted upon to produce an aerosol, vapor, or other emission to be inhaled or otherwise absorbed by the user, regardless of whether the solution, substance, or other material contains nicotine. So then in a lot of places, what you'll see is that the existing statutes on, in this case, um, license and applications for a license to sell tobacco products is being expanded to include e-liquids. So this would um, prohibit anyone from engaging in the retail sale of e-liquids in addition to other types of tobacco products and tobacco substitutes without a tobacco license and applying a um, penalty of misdemeanor and not more than $200 for the first offense and not more than $500 for each subsequent offense for someone who sells e-liquids along with the other products without getting a tobacco license and a tobacco substitute enforcement. That's what they're selling. Uh, this prohib would ex again expand the prohibition on individuals under 16 years of age selling tobacco products to include e-liquids. Um, and in subsection G, under the existing law, we're really just replacing this term substances containing nicotine or otherwise intended for use with a tobacco substitute with the much easier term e-liquids. So no person shall engage in the retail sale of these products unless they are a licensed wholesale dealer or have purchased them from a licensed wholesale dealer. So that's a terminology change, not a substantive change there. 
existing section of 1003 that prohibits the sale of or, or provision of tobacco products, tobacco substitutes, or tobacco paraphernalia to anyone under 21 years of age. This adds e-liquids in there as well. Also adds e-liquids to the prohibitions on where persons holding a tobacco license can display or store the products. Um, there are existing restrictions there. There's also an exemption uh, that would be expanded to include tobacco substitutes or e-liquids in a commercial establishment where no one under 21 years of age is permitted to enter. Um, and Man, I remember the debate about vending machines. Anyway, that was before my time here. And then the debate about cabarets. I'm <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, just curious, uh, what's the current uh, age for tobacco product purchase now? Yeah. It's, it, so this wouldn't change the age. The age was raised. This wasn't aware. That was another one. Uh, yeah. It was in my time here, 2019. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it was, it was raised. Which cannabis was, that was raised in 21. Well, it was cannabis. Cannabis was, oh, okay. cannabis was started now. as 21. I'm trying to remember when 21 was. Like 2019. It was my cool. first session here. Cool. That's right. Yeah. So you did it. You did it. I yeah. wasn't on the committee. I mean, I voted for it, but I was not. Not, not relevant to this bill. What is cannabis now? 21. All of, everything's 21. And I think cannabis, uh, my last look at that, you know, there are no flavors. Your last look? The last look at the cannabis uh, regulations didn't allow for flavors. Flavors. Like faith, like flavors or any of the flavors? Or there are flavors, flavors in gummies. I know. Yeah. You got to look at that. Edibles have flavors. Yeah. Oh. So just to follow the intent of the bill, the bill is not intended to alter the age of, no. it's to eliminate the flavored tobacco products. Yes, and to add regulation of the e-liquids, the, the substance that goes with the e-cigarettes okay. um, into the tobacco laws. All right, so we are we're following along on paper on page eight. Um, so this would add e-liquids to the statute around uh, requirement that someone exhibit proper proof of age to uh, be able to purchase these products. Uh, and in section 1005, adding in e-liquids as far as um, people who, um, persons under 21 years of age possessing products or misrepresenting their age. The actual statute should say for purchasing tobacco products, but um, so these are conforming. These are, yes, these are really conforming. That's a good way to say it. To conforming revisions to carry out this idea of putting the e-liquids into, the, um, into the tobacco statutes. So same thing in section 1006 around posting signs. 1007 penalties for furnishing, selling or furnishing products to someone under 21 years of age, uh, correcting or updating the name on page 12 of the uh, group that would receive, one of the groups that would receive the report from the um, Division of Liquor Control. Okay. around their compliance testing. Um, we get a little bit broader here in section 1009 uh, around contraband and seizure. Um, and this is kind of updating the statutes to reflect all the different products that we have. So under existing law, and this statute had not been updated, under existing law, any cigarettes or other tobaccos that have been sold, offered for sale, or possessed for sale in violation of various statutes um, are deemed contraband and are subject to seizure by the Commissioner of Liquor and Lottery, Commissioner of Taxes, or law enforcement. This would add the tobacco substitutes, e-liquids, and tobacco paraphernalia if they have been seized as contraband. Um, or, or deeming them as contraband and allowing them to be subject to seizure if they've been sold, offered, or possessed in violation of statute. 
Um, and then referring to all items seized under this section shall be destroyed, not just cigarettes or tobacco products. We get to internet sales. So uh, under existing law, no one is allowed to uh, cause cigarettes, roll your own tobacco, little cigars, snap tobacco substitutes, or the long terminology that means e-liquids um, or tobacco paraphernalia that was ordered online or by mail or by phone to be shipped to anyone other than a licensed wholesale dealer or retail dealer. This is changing that terminology to refer to e-liquid, so we're being consistent and we have a defined term and doing a little conforming revision here on page 14 um, that, um, around the language allowing the attorney general to impose a civil penalty and specifying that each <laughs> shipment or transport of any of these products <clears throat> excuse me, that are already required to be sold only to or through a uh, or shipped to a wholesaler or retailer um, would be included in that provision. Section 10, 12, 1012 is again making uh, informing changes around the packaging for products containing nicotine. Under existing law, we refer to liquid nicotine. This uses the e liquids definition. Yes, and I will stop because I see there are a couple of um, tobacco paraphernalia. Is it defined term? I don't think it's defined in the. Bill. Not defined in this bill, but I think yes, probably it's probably sure. defined oh, term. Sure. Let me. Is that your question? Exactly. There's a bit of a gray area there considering the other products on the market. Right. Um, yes. I want to put it out there because it's got. Kind of yes, up. good point. And I will, you know, we can confer with the director who handles cannabis to make sure there is not an unintentional overlap. I think mean, she's been aware yes. of this. This overlap. Um, all right. So let me stop. Share and put up this one. There it is. All right. So the definition of tobacco paraphernalia is any device used, intended for use, or designed for use in smoking, inhaling, ingesting, or otherwise introducing tobacco products into the human body, or for preparing tobacco for smoking, inhaling, ingesting, or otherwise introducing into the human body including devices for holding tobacco, rolling papers, wraps, cigarette rolling machines, pipes, water pipes, carburation devices, bombs, and hookahs. And I do think the definitions in the cannabis statutes are, uh, are, are track the ones in here so that they're not inconsistent provisions, but I'd be happy to- We're gonna have questions with Michelle. Yeah, we'll probably have, have folks reaching out about that yeah. one. Um, bring Michelle in. Yeah. That's good. Thank you for doing that. Sure. Yeah. Is that your question? Sometimes? It was my question. Yeah. Great. So let me take this one down. So the section 1012 was making that conforming change to use this consistent terminology around e-liquids rather than this standalone section that had talked about liquid nicotine, but otherwise not changing the substance. <clears throat> then we get into sort of the heart of the bill, which is the flavored tobacco products, flavored tobacco substitutes, and flavored e-liquids prohibited. This is a new section. You can see it's all underlined. We've got some definitions in here for this section. The first is characterizing flavor, means a taste or aroma other than the taste or aroma of tobacco imparted either prior to or during consumption of a tobacco product or tobacco substitute or a component part or byproduct of a tobacco product or tobacco substitute. The term includes tastes or aromas relating to any fruit, chocolate, vanilla, honey, maple, candy, cocoa, dessert, alcoholic beverage, mint, menthol, wintergreen, herb or spice, or other food or drink 
or to any conceptual flavor that imparts a taste or aroma that is distinguishable from tobacco flavor, but may not relate to any particular known flavor. <laughs> so a lot of these definitions come from either um, largely the same as or modified versions of what other states have done, either in their legislation or in some cases they were doing emergency rulemaking a few years back. We'll say I did add maple because it didn't seem like Vermont should have a list of characterizing flavors that did not include maple. <laughs> you can take it out if you want. Um, and, uh, and the language at the end about conceptual flavors, I think the chair is laughing because she remembers that we hear, uh, Senator Harker probably does as well, from some of the advocates that there are flavors like unicorn puke, which is in fact, to my knowledge, not related to any particular known flavor, but is a conceptual flavor. <laughs> sort of the Harry Potter. Potter. Good job. I think of it as the Harry Potter flavor. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes, like Bertie Bots, everything. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Uh, all right, so that is characterizing flavor. And then a flavored e liquid <laughs> is any e liquid, which is our definition, definition from earlier, with a characterizing flavor. A, an e-liquid shall be presumed to be a flavored e-liquid if a licensee, manufacturer, or licensee or manufacturer's agent or employee has made a statement or claim directed to consumers or the public, whether expressed or implied, that the product has a distinguishable taste or aroma other than the, the taste or aroma of tobacco. Flavored tobacco product is any tobacco product with a characterizing flavor. And again, there's this presumption that a tobacco product is a flavored tobacco product. If a licensee, manufacturer, or their agent or employee has made a statement or claim directed to consumers or the public, expressed or implied, that the product has a distinguishable taste or aroma other than that of tobacco. And flavored tobacco substitute means any tobacco substitute with a characterizing flavor. So there are different types of tobacco substitutes. Um, some of them are all one device. Some of them have a cartridge that goes into them. Um, that's sometimes where the definition of liquid e-liquid comes in. Uh, the FDA has done some regulation already around flavors for the all-in-one devices. No, the cartridge devices, but not the all-in-one devices or the tanks, open tank products. So a flavored tobacco substitute is any tobacco substitute with a characterizing flavor. And again, we have this presumption that it is flavored if the licensee or manufacturer or their agent has made a statement or claim directed to consumers or the public, express or implied that the product has a distinguishable taste or aroma other than tobacco. A tobacco retailer means any individual, partnership, joint venture, society, club, trustee, trust, association, organization, or corporation who owns, operates, or manages any retail establishment that has a tobacco license from the Division of Liquor Control. So then we get to the very short but broad reaching um, prohibition. No person shall engage in the retail sale of any flavored tobacco product flavored e-liquid or flavored tobacco substitute. If a tobacco retailer or their agent or employee violates this section, then the retailer will be subject to a civil penalty of not more than $100 for a first offense or $500 for any subsequent offense. Which are the same um, penalties in place for sale to underage. An action under this section shall be brought in the same manner as for a traffic violation pursuant to 23 ASA Chapter 24. That means it goes through the Judicial Bureau um, and be brought within 24 hours after the occurrence of the alleged violation. Section 3 would amend the Judicial Bureau's jurisdiction to give them jurisdiction over violations of that provision on banning the sale, retail sale of flavored tobacco products, e-liquids, and tobacco substitutes. Um, section four is just adding e-liquids to an exemption in existing law um, around sale of alcoholic beverages by somebody who works in the store. Um, section five is again making another conforming revision to specify that uh, the prohibition on tobacco use on public school grounds includes prohibition on the use of e-liquids on public school grounds. Section six is a conforming change to the charge of the Substance Misuse Prevention Oversight and Advisory Council to include 
um, that their prevention initiatives should encompass all substances at risk of misuse, including, and it adds in the definition of e-liquids. Um, and so we just have tobacco products, tobacco substitutes, and e-liquids instead of the more cumbersome way of describing those. Section seven is also conforming change to that tobacco tax definition at the beginning that we, when we took out the reference in other tobacco products to the section from the statute, we're using the actual language um, here. So make a few grammatical changes and then specifies that the, the term other tobacco products includes e-liquids with that definition and delivery devices sold separately for use with a tobacco substitute or e-liquid. Section eight is the last substantive section. This would direct the Office of the Attorney General to report back by December 1st to uh, this committee and other House and Senate committees regarding whether and to what extent Vermont can legally restrict advertising and regulate the content of labels for electronic cigarettes and other vaping related products in the state. And the act would take effect on September 1st. So um, the, the last one I think is really important given what we're gonna learn about marketing issues. And then the labeling piece, I know that there was, there was a whole lot of work that went on with labeling and especially in South America where then now they have photographs of cancer, cancerous lungs and things. Um, yeah. And then the other question, I think we're going to want to know what other states are doing at this point. I thought you were going to ask that. I you knew, you knew I was going to ask that. Yes. So there are five states that have full bans. Um, oh. Massachusetts, New Jersey, New York, Rhode Island, and most recently California, which passed theirs in uh, December by referendum. Full, full ban on flavor. Full ban on flavor. All flavored tobacco products. Um, in Massachusetts, they restrict the sale uh, or ban the sale of flavored tobacco products, including menthol cigarettes. Um, New Jersey, New York, and Rhode Island ban flavored e-cigarettes, and now California has the ban on both flavored e-cigarettes and menthol cigarettes. As I noted at the outset, the FDA is in the process of adopting rules that would also ban menthol, um, which would be nationwide. And then there are other states with some restrictions on sale of some flavored e-cigarettes. Maryland and Utah have those. And other states have had some temporary bans by emergency rule. And then there are a number of municipalities around the country that also ban. Can we get that posted up on our webpage? That or I took it from the campaign for the tobacco, yeah. for tobacco free kids. I know. Um, well, they'll be coming in too. So right. I think yeah. you'll be hearing from advocates who may have yeah more extensive resources and knowledge question um I, I think jen just answered it It was mo mostly about the and i'm sorry mrs when you said it before the fda i thought they were in the process of banning menthol they are in the process of banning yeah. menthol but they're they have a proposed rule and it is, it is unclear when they will be adopting their final rule that will actually be in effect Okay, because I remember that fall was sort of a sticky point. Uh, so yeah, and it's in the this. findings that that statement on the FDA. Yeah, okay. Yeah. We're, yeah. They were gone call about a year and a half ago. Yes, we did this in 2021, this right. bill, and then at that point, the FDA had done not. In 2022, they have. Yeah, right. So the FDA has done a couple of things. They have they have uh, restricted sale of certain types of flavored e-cigarettes, um, but that's the piece where they did kind of the uh, the kind the cartridges go in, but not the ones that are all in one and not the open tank where people can get filled, you know, refill with whatever flavor they want. Yeah. Um, and then they also have done have required some market. I think even for the other ones, they're still doing some market approvals um, where manufacturers have to get their products approved by the FDA before they can be sold. But there's been, I think, some slow rollout of that. So uh, the advocates may have a better sense of exactly what's going on at the federal level. But there, there's some, some movement, but not nearly as extensive as what you're looking at or what California and Massachusetts have done. But 
I know we're going to hear more about this, but it's helpful to have that. Yeah, up front. Thank you, Chair. And I'm not sure who I'm directing this question to, but I think I heard that the waivers will be banned on school grounds, school properties. Um, so e-cigarettes are already banned on school grounds. This is adding a specific reference to e-liquids being banned. So under existing law, no person is permitted to use tobacco products or tobacco substitutes meaning an e-cigarette on public school grounds or at public school sponsored functions, but it's not quite as specific about not having the liquid nicotine stuff with you. So if they were in two separate containers yeah. or something. So that would include a spectator coming onto the grounds to watch a football game or uh, yeah, it says on um, school ground, public school grounds or at public school sponsored functions. So right. I believe so. And it allows school boards to adopt policies um, that include confiscation and appropriate referrals to law enforcement. So schools may have more details in their policies. Okay, yeah, I was just wondering what that looks like to school officials who probably already have that in their yeah. list of rules. Does that uh, would be good uh, in your education committee to mm -hmm. bring that up yeah. and see, you know, what it looks like. Yeah. And I do think we've heard testimony in past years from uh, from whether it's school administrators or the principals association. Yes. Um, it was helpful for them to have it in statute. I think no, I think it was more about what they see in the way of of use and impact of um, of use youth use. Yeah, it gives some authority to do something. Right. right. Got at you. Right. Okay, so it can be really helpful. Yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, I'm aware that cigars are often flavored with brandies and rums and stuff like that. Cherry. Cherry. Does this incorporate that? Would this become a prohibition against? Uh, I believe it does. Let me just. It's disgusting. Um, yes, yeah, so tobacco products include cigars. Cigars. Yeah. So everywhere we you know, bans flavored tobacco products and police flavored cigars. And the date at which this becomes effective is September 2023, right? It is. And so that theoretically provides two months to use up inventory. Right. So, I mean, it, you can choose a different date. The September is, um, yeah. The September was the compromise date reached for implementation of the uh, age restriction, yeah. raising from 18 to 21. Yeah. Um, so I put that in here as a as a placeholder. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Yeah. Tall. You can decide. Anything else that we, we want to ask Jen? I've I've written down a bunch of things, and folks, we're going to hear. We're going to want to hear from. Certainly what other states are doing is important and any anything that's happening at the federal level is going to be important. And then what are the health consequences of using these things and my, my particular interest is understanding the mental mask myth, mythology a little bit because people say it helps them quit and yet the data that is not there so but that's the Department of Health and others are going to have to help us with that. And then the other issue for me, and I think it may also be for you folks, is, you know, once we begin the prevention uh, of using these things, what are the cost savings within the healthcare system? That can, there are predictions that we've seen that are quite significant, so we want to understand what those are, if any, and I know that there's, there'll be some data that helps us with that. Go ahead. I'm not quite sure how to frame this, but right. how, how do we represent uh, those who uh, might feel this would be an erosion of personal choice? Uh, that, I know it's a tough, really tough yeah. uh, concept, but how do we, I always want to hear the counter argument. Yeah, well, we'll hear the counter on it, no question. I just wonder who, who yeah. represents it. Um, I think there are a lot of people out there that do, including the people who are selling these products, uh, marketing the products. Well, that's different. And then the individuals who are utilizing it. That, right. And so we're not saying take nicotine or tobacco out of the market, but we are looking at 
the effect of having flavors on the market and then how you know how compelling will that information be to us so you, the question you ask is like the fundamental question for so much of what we do but it's an important question yeah, especially in relation to the financial outcome in terms of health, health outcomes, because personal choice, but who ends up paying for it in the long run? I mean, that's that would be something Good point. That we should discuss. Yeah, we all pay for it. Yeah, sounds good. Point. We got a lot of a lot of things to talk about. Oops, thanks. It. Great. And we're very early today. I can't oh, yay. Are we done? Not, not yet. Oh, okay. Not yet. I'm, I'm not going anywhere. I'm just curious. <laughs> I think what we'll do is before we go offline, do you, Jen, do you have anything else that you think we should know? I don't think so. Okay. These are, you you know, the know what's in these, and we'd be happy to come in and work with them on. Work on them with you in the future. We fill this up with questions. Oh, good. So this is good. And so I think what we'll do is we'll we'll transition to another topic. All right. And um, we will look at. We we don't have it on our agenda, but it's something that will be on our agenda and a sort of leapfrog. Keep moving forward with it. And that th those are the appointments that we have from the governor's office. And um, is there something missing on the agenda? No, 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 no. <laughs> We're laughing at What's happening? Oh, we're laughing. Wow. Is there a good like, question here? Or organizational skills? Or what? Organizational. Oh, or organizational yeah. skills? I truly agree. Yeah. 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 Um, so let's go to confirmations, and I know that Senator Weeks has been working on this a little bit, and we will have to schedule in some folks, but we also have a list of people. Send us the list. Hang on a second. Do you want a quick break first? I would like these in the first break. Let's take a quick break, and let's come back here around 11.20, not quite 11.20, and then we'll spend another... 20 15 20 minutes on confirmations and we'll get to that i don't need that much time so okay, i didn't actually call anybody because i don't no, 